right, it is 5.04 p.m. on Tuesday, September 6th, and we'll go ahead and call the City Council Committee on City Services meeting to order. A note that this meeting is being audio and video recorded, so both the meeting and all who are in it um, are being audio and video recorded. Um, and first up on the agenda is public comment. So if there are any members of the public here who wish to speak, um, you can go ahead and raise either your actual or virtual hand and we'll do that. And just a housekeeping note, if you could go ahead and mute yourself, usually that's done automatically, but it's not today, um, but that way we don't get feedback. So if you're not, if you could mute yourself and then I'll, I'll help you unmute when it's time. Okay, thanks. Um, so if you could keep your comments to two to three minutes, that would be ideal. And we'll go ahead and get started with Jackie Balance. Hi, everybody. I'm Jackie from Florence. And uh, this looks like a very friendly group of counselors. I've been to community uh, resources and to legislative matters. This is my first visit to city services. I'm here to see what y'all do and find out what it's about. At last week's city council meeting, the counselors suggested that the best way for citizens to get their voices heard is to attend your committee meetings. So here I am. I looked at the agenda and I see you're going to vote on Carolyn Mish's appointment to Wayne Fiden's position. And I want to congratulate her and say, I read in one of the, um, somewhere online, one, her CV or something that she spent a semester in Ibadan in Nigeria when she was undergrad. And that I, I thought was very, very interesting. I learned a few words of Yoruba uh, from Nigerian friends in Chicago. So I want to say to Carolyn, Kosipiti olorun kosi. And um, if that's not in your vocabulary, it simply means there is no place where God is not. God is everywhere, even in the planning office. And I sincerely hope that Carolyn in her new position will be open to listening to citizen voices and citizens' ideas to, to make our city the best it can be. Last comment, I see that in the council meeting, the, the, the whole business of pot shops was referred to city services as well as uh, community resources, I think. And I wonder if you're going to be taking that up under new business today. I'd appreciate a word at the early part of the meeting so I know what, how long I need to stay. Thank you. Thank you, Jackie. Uh, and next up we have KCC. Uh, thank you. I guess um, my concern was also with uh, the pot shops. I, I guess main concern is uh, we already have uh, at, at least eight or ten uh, pot, uh, pot shops throughout Northampton. Um, there really doesn't need to be uh, an, another uh, pot shop. Plus, um, there's a lot of uh, addiction, uh, especially by the, the THC, uh, through through uh, uh, pot, even medical marijuana and a lot of the med uh, marijuana isn't distributed. Um, you're, you're given a marijuana card, which means that you can use as, as much or little as, as you can. So when people self-medicate, they have a tendency to take uh, too much that, that can, that can uh, create an addiction and create more problems, uh, which is uh, ba basically a, a moneymaker for, for those running the, the shops. And it's, uh, they really don't care about the individuals. And, uh, we do have a pizza shop there that has uh, been thriving for as long, 30, 40 years, as long as, as I, can, I can remember. And um, since it, it's popular, uh, and a lot of people uh, go there, it, it would be uh, better suited to have a pizza shop than a pot shop. Thank you, Casey. Um, Laura, just a quick, could you make me a co-host? Thanks. Okay, and um, I, I didn't mention at the beginning of the meeting, um, but just a, a note for those who are less familiar with attending council meetings, we, we don't respond during public comment time, but I, I did hear that there was a question. So um, next up is Lizzie. Hi, thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak this afternoon. Um, my name is Lizzie. I'm a sober marijuana addict of 15 years. I know firsthand how pot smoking can slide into tortured addiction. And I think one of the most dangerous things about the huge 
saturation of dispensaries in our communities. It sends the message that it's not addictive and it's not harmful when it's just as addictive and harmful as alcohol. If you're somebody that can enjoy a glass of wine with dinner, that's fantastic. I'm not. If you are somebody that can smoke a little pot on the weekend and move on with their lives, that's fantastic. There are thousands in this community that are not. Um, from the outside appearances, when I was actively using, I looked like a high functioning, intelligent young woman that had everything going for me. On the inside, I could not function or leave the house without getting high. It's just a matter of time for those of us that become addicts for it to go from a few hits of pot a day to not functioning and not being employable. On top of my eight years of active addiction, it took me many, many years of sobriety to get my life back together. It was arduous and painful. I lost so much time to pot. Marijuana addiction is quieter than that of alcohol, heroin, or cocaine, but I assure you, it is the same agony. Pot is a part of the story of almost every alcoholic and addict I have heard speak in my 15 years of sobriety in AA. In those 15 years, I have heard thousands and thousands of alcoholics and addicts speak, and almost every single one has pot as part of their story. There is nothing like an insider's view, which is why I have broken my anonymity to speak to the government of our city. I can't imagine how anybody who is addicted or dependent on pot in Northampton could hope to get sober here with 12 dispensaries and counting. It went from being one of the best places to get sober to one of the most dangerous places to try to stay sober and one of the most difficult places to stay sober. We talk about it in AA meetings incessantly, over and over and over again. People talk about their struggles with the numbers of dispensaries. These are all people just like me who voted for it to be legal. Thank goodness it's legal. We do not need 12, most of which do not provide medical marijuana, only a small handful do. That means their only business is helping people get inebriated and taking their money. There is no difference between recreational marijuana pot shop owners and the drug dealers I used to meet on sketchy corners and in cars. There is no difference. I speak for the active addicts in our community. I speak for the sober addicts and I speak for the suffering families in Northampton. Please vote immediately to cap the number of dispensaries in Northampton at 12 or fewer. For thousands of us, our lives depend on it. One more thing I wanna add is that I did not go to rehab or get sober in Northampton. I do not show up on the marijuana statistics. The thousands that are actively using and addicted to marijuana do not show up on the statistics. It's only those that partake in the services of ServiceNet, the recovery center, or have gone to rehab here. Most of us fall through the cracks of those statistics. We cannot be quantified. Please do not forget about us. We have everything on the line. Thank you. Thank you, Lizzie. And then I see Ananda. Ananda. Oh. Um, you're, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, sorry about that. I'm using my phone, which is always a weird format. Um, so like the first woman who spoke, this is my first time going to one of your meetings. So nice to be here. Um, 
I feel badly. I'm not usually super civically engaged. I vote and everything, but I just don't have time to make these meetings. So even though Zoom is a weird format, I do appreciate that you have it. Um, I'm here to talk about um, requesting that the city um, or the powers that be um, seriously consider caps on the marijuana dispensaries as well. Um, I'm not a person in recovery, but I have a lot of people in my life who are, and I have worked in youth substance use prevention for almost a decade now. And, um, you know, trying to follow data is hard. I was just researching before I got here. Um, and it is true, we're not seeing a huge nationwide uptick in marijuana use for young people. I'd like to take credit and say it's because we've been doing such a good job with our prevention efforts and health education. Um, but I think part of it is just that what we're seeing instead is this huge jump for the 18 to 30 year olds. And um, beyond all the data, I just, um, I just kind of feel like Northampton um, just got really heady with the thoughts of taxation, like the tax money that we're getting from marijuana, um, the fact that they kind of wanted to be seen as like, kind of like the vacation spot where you can get pot anywhere, liberal and all that sort of stuff. And, and I get that, but, um, and I also get that there's a lot of bars, but now I just feel like there's too much of all of it. You know, um, I just keep thinking that there should be some balance we can achieve. And it's like, you know, I, I don't personally use pot, so I'm sure that there's many, many varieties and the, the differences between the shops may appeal to people who really like it, especially tourists. But for somebody who lives here and raises kids here and, you know, wants to see my kids stay here, I, I just want to see the identity of Northampton and Florence, especially Florence, which still kind of feels like a Mayberry, um, not become another pot central. Like, it would be nice to have different shops and businesses in place. And as some of the earlier speakers said too, there's also a really large recovery community and it's now, you know, it's kind of like being eating disordered. You can't avoid food anymore. So it's like alcohol might be your trigger and now there's marijuana. And I just think that it's, we're just gone too far. Um, so I just wanted to take a couple minutes and just say that I also back caps and I hope that the city will consider them. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, and then I see Rick, uh, your hand up. You missed, um, just because you weren't here quite at the beginning, if you can keep your comments in the two to three minute range, that's ideal. It's not as strict as a full council meeting, um, but um, you're up for public comment. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Steve Councilor. It's great to see you all and Mr. Dwight. Always great to see you. It's, it's been a while. And I first of all, I wanted to thank you all. Uh, I know that uh, many of you, uh, yes, you know, given we just uh, celebrated Labor Day, you have, either have other businesses or other jobs. So uh, I really appreciate all that you do. Um, I uh, have sent uh, uh, some research to the uh, mayor's office, director of public health, and the counselors as well. And I wanted to highlight uh, one of the pieces of research, in case you didn't have a chance to read it, in favor of a cap. And that is um, uh, from Washington State University that location of cannabis shops, uh, retailers influence uh, adolescents' intentions to use marijuana. And this is a new study by the Journal of Health Communication at Washington State University. So, you know, it's, it's not only the uh, billboard, billboards and the advertisements, which you know, I see when I'm driving to Springfield or seeing the shops, a myriad number of shops that we pass in Northampton, but it's also the location. And uh, many of these uh, shops are around, you know, residential neighborhoods. There's one proposed in Florence that's um, um, a few hundred feet from a, a DMH CSO after school program. And as we mentioned, the ice cream shops that the walking traffic, you know, comes right by. Uh, the pizza factory location. So, um, and and that shop happens to be a, 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 um, a recreational marijuana facility where a lot of people are thinking, oh, gee, I, you know, I don't have to go downtown to get my medical marijuana. My understanding is they cannot, but there are delivery services and uh, lots of other ways for people to get uh, cannabis. Uh, so the actual uh, density of marijuana retailers of an area um, is an issue. Um, and uh, again, the research shows that this uh, was uh, likely to report an increase in drug use, um, you know, by those uh, living in those communities. 
So the results of the research team study concluded a significant number of policy implications um, and that legalized uh, recreational marijuana is, uh, you know, experts are grappling with ways to adhere to the drug's legal status. We're trying to prevent adolescent um, marijuana use. And there are um, a whole bunch of studies as well in terms of, you know, cognition or risk towards uh, pregnancy even later in life with uh, neonatal birth. Um, so lots of reasons why uh, adolescents, uh, teens, even now, or later in life who might uh, struggle with anxiety and depression uh, can uh, have decreased either mental or physical, physical, whoops, sorry, uh, I can stop that, uh, physical health as well. So the findings particularly relevant given that most states have legalized recreational marijuana, have not restricted their proximity to neighborhoods or living areas, which may be particularly challenging. Um, so, uh, I appreciate that this uh, cap issue has uh, gone to committee and a number of committees, and I want to encourage the council to further this uh, discussion and bring it to a full council vote. And I want to thank you so very much for your time, as always. Okay, thank you, Rick. Okay, is there anybody else here that hasn't had a chance for public comment that would like to participate? You can either raise your hand under the reactions tab, or you can wave it and I'll look. Okay. Oh, yes. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm working on how to re refer to you. I will refer to you as Bill Dwight. You have the floor. The ones I can unmute you. Yeah, that, you just call me that guy. <laughs> that guy. <laughs> um, I, I'm sorry to jump in at the last minute, but I I, I want to say rah rah rah, Carolyn Mish. I'm really psyched at the possibility of her <clears throat> being our planner, uh, continuing a legacy of of, of conscientious uh, planning that has seen Northampton flourish as a result. <laughs> Carolyn is part and parcel of that, and I'm really glad that you're considering her. And I and I hope that God you you approve. So. And then I'm here to testify. So on another item, so I'll, I'll bow out. Thank you. Thanks, that guy. Okay. Um, is there anybody else that wanted to participate in public comment? Okay, so seeing none, um, committee, if you'll indulge me, I'd like to take some things slightly out of order because we do have guests and I'd like to, to honor their time tonight. Um, but before I do, I wanted to respond because there, there was a question that came up and I'm, I'm hearing just a, a slight turn of phrase regarding what's on the agenda for the committee meeting this evening. So just wanna clarify um, and be able to answer that. We did in our most recent city council meeting on day discuss that the uh, city council committees can have a role in discussing the potential for a cap there isn't a specific agenda item, although that can certainly come up during new business. Um, and I anticipate um, a discussion, a brief discussion regarding an approach would come up, um, though there be, it's not an agenda, there wouldn't be a substantive discussion or a vote this evening. Um, so I hope that helps to, to clarify. So the city council hasn't doesn't have an ordinance that it's referred to committee, but we did talk in our meeting about the committees addressing this issue. So I hope that helps with where that's at at this moment. Okay. Um, then what I'd like to do is move on. Um, I'm gonna skip or circle back to number four a little bit later on and take up first um, item five, which is the appointment of Carolyn Mish as director of office, director of the Office of Planning and Sustainability. This was referred by city council, a process note for those that are less familiar with the committees, the city council committee on city services approves appointments um, to city boards and commissions and department heads. So the mayor's office does the search and has the search committee and makes the recommendation. And then the city council is responsible for confirming those appointments. Um, so um, we, we were talking very briefly, we noticed there may have been a, a brief oversight in August vacation agendas and um, we missed the mayor being here to introduce Carolyn Mish as 
um, her choice for director of the Department of Planning and Sustainability. Although, as we've discussed and as we heard from former Councillor Bill Dwight, um, Carolyn is, is no stranger to the city of Northampton. Um, I did have a chance, I can just um, sort of briefly generally talk about the search process. There was a um, open nationwide search through um, the channels that people seeking jobs as to, through city planning and as um, department heads in city planning um, would seek out. Um, so there was a national search, the search was um, extended. Carolyn is uh, one of the candidates who applied and as the now former assistant director of planning and sustainability um, is someone whose background and resume and experience and knowledge of Northampton, um, according to the members of the search committee I talked to um, rose above and Carolyn was a unanimous choice from the search committee um, and is the mayor's recommendation um, to lead the department of planning and sustainability moving forward. Um, so the process here is that counselors have a chance to ask questions um, and weigh in. But before we do that, Carolyn, I wanted to give you a chance to see if you'd like to address the committee um, before I go to counselors. Thank you, um, Councillor Foster. Um, it's really, um, it's exciting to be here. I appreciate the opportunity. Um, and of course, I'm excited to take on this role. Um, I've worked with um, most of you for a while, some of you less time, but I'm excited to get to be able to work with um, Councilor Perry and Councilor Gore some, um, um, some more over, over the years, I hope. And um, I feel um, like there's so much work that um, the community has put into sort of planning and creating um, a framework for where we want to go as a community. I'm excited to work on those projects, um, to continue the work on that, um, and particularly um, continue the, the important work on um, addressing, you know, our climate um, and carbon reduction targets and this housing crisis, I think are sort of two intertwined issues that are really important for the community. And we've got this um, great plan adopted by the planning board and endorsed by city council and had, with a lot of community input. So um, I guess I'll leave it at that. Thanks, Carolyn. Uh, counselors, here's, here's your chance if other counselors on the committee have questions or comments. Councilor LaBarge. Oh, you're muted, Councilor. Saying the host, oh, there you go. Thank you. Got it. Caroline, I have three questions for you. Now that you are transitioning from assistant director to director within the office, how do you see your role within the department changing? Um, so I, I think that um, on the one hand, um, I think it'll be perhaps an easier transition than um, coming at it, you know, brand new because I'm already very familiar and have been working on a lot of the projects in the department. I think the um, biggest shift will be sort of into more um, project management and personnel management, um, which of which I've done a little bit in the past um, through my years um, with the city of Northampton. Um, and I think that, um, so those are probably the primary, um, those, those um, roles will um, become more of what um, I'm doing rather than um, sort of more of a, um, a policy and project management um, um, work and oversight as opposed to sort of regulatory and implementation of the long range plan. Thank you on that question. The second one, you have been primarily responsible for permit processing and the introduction of zoning ordinances. While it seems that Wayne has been more involved in grant applications, land acquisitions, community development projects, 
such as coordination of restylance hub planning and comprehensive planning. Can you answer to that? Um, so in terms of um, the um, sort of who will take over those roles and the shifts there, I think that, um, yes, I, um, I, as part of sort of that project management role that includes um, land acquisition and um, grant acquisition to help implement the project. So that will be part of my role. I think what I have started to do and what we've been talking about internally in our office is sort of creating a, um, a, a shift to broaden out responsibilities to more people in the office. So um, where the those things make sense. So land acquisition, um, it will also be part of um, Sarah Lavalley's role, who has been active um, and has been staffing the Conservation Commission. And of course, when we acquire land, there's um, that open space is under the jurisdiction of Conservation Commission. So there's some synergies there. And so there will be some shifts, I think, in, in some of those responsibilities, but ultimately it's going to be my job to sort of oversee that and make sure they're, you know, the right people are fit with the right um, kinds of um, projects. Um, um, I think you mentioned the Resilience Hub um, and where we're going with that. That, of course, is a huge project that's in our, you know, um, on the radar and is very important to the city and, of course, um, our charge to continue with that um, and to find a, a home for um, this really important resource that um, is has been developed over the um course of the last couple of years at, with um, Wayne Fiden's um, stewardship and oversight. Um, in terms of regulatory changes, I will, I still see myself involved in that, but uh, as well, bringing other people along in the department to help with that. There's still many shifts that um, I think need to be both tweaked and introduced to um, uh, address the goals and um, policy objectives and, and implement policy objectives in the, in the long range plan. I appreciate you for that question. Thank you. Also, what specific responsibilities do you envision, Carolyn, yourself keeping and which do you, and which do you envision delegating to the new assistant director? <laughs> um, well, that's still a work in progress, um, but I, um, I, and just so you know, I did, we've already completed the process. I've hired Sarah LaValle as the assistant director. Um, so um, I'm happy about that. Um, she's very well qualified for that position. And we've worked well together over the last, um, since she started here 10 years ago or so. Um, so we're the, one of the things that I described on, um, previously is sort of that transition of land acquisition to Sarah, um, because she is um, also still keeping Conservation Commission um, uh, duties. And so, and also she has oversight uh, with, um, over the CPA funding. So there's some land acquisition, um, a role there that's complementary with CPA. Um, we're still sort of working out the details of all the the, the work um, that um, will be just um, sort of shifted through the department. So um, I think those are probably the two major areas that um, we're focusing on now. I want to thank you very much for answering these three questions that shows a lot of people, your experience and your knowledge. Thank you, Carolyn. Councilor Gore. Hi, Carolyn. Um, just a quick question about, um, just wanting to know what projects are coming down the pipeline that you would feel excited about working on or any projects that Wayne Fiden had worked on that you're excited or super interested in working on? Sure, absolutely. Well, I will also say that um, 
thankfully, um, Wayne um, is still working on um, uh, and, and on a contract basis with some of these projects that were started under his purview, which is great because we have probably anywhere between 40 and 50 projects that are currently um, sort of underway in different at different levels. So um, I think I'm really excited about the hub. Um, Wayne is still participating in that in a couple of sort of related projects. Uh, I think that will provide an enormous benefit to so many members of our community, not the people who would necessarily be using the hub, but also um, our downtown businesses and and um, and provide you know needed services and that connection to um, resources that um, so many folks in our community. Um, need. I think um, it's really important to continue the work on making transportation connections, um, uh, multimodal or um, um, non-vehicular transportation connections throughout the city and particularly in places where um, neighborhoods that aren't connected right now with um, either bicycle paths or sidewalks. Um, and so we've got some grant projects out there that are underway or that are we're in the pipeline to be um, designed and constructed. And I think that's really important for um, allowing greater access and mobility for people of all ages in the community. Um, I think that um, you know, again, I talked a little bit about housing. I think housing is really um, a critical point that we, we need to talk about as a community and providing housing. We have a housing gap. I think I've talked in in many different forums in front of city council about this, the number of units that we need at sort of all income levels. And um, I think that's um, critical for, not just for providing a place for people to live, but also it, it ties into our um, economic development um, capacity, our, um, who we wanna be as a community if we're pro to provide housing for all the people who need housing. Um, and um, it's an equity issue. And I think we need to address that as well. Um, and you know other things that um, are new projects coming down the line. There are a lot of grant opportunities um, that have opened up just this year, but also now with the federal government opening up um, um, interest in providing funds for local and state and regional governments to um, address um, infrastructure needs and particularly address um, the changing impact that climate has on our communities. One of the projects I'm starting to work with, um, with Chris Mason from Central Services, who's the energy officer, obviously, is looking at whether or not we can create a district heat system, um, district geothermal heat system for municipal buildings. And that would be a really exciting project if we can really get that underway. It involves, um, you know, a lot of that is in Chris's wheelhouse, um, but it connects to sort of our goals in, um, the plan, but also if we can connect it to some new affordable housing opportunities, I think that would be really um, an amazing project to be able to tie in and it, and it sort of fits all the um, goals and objectives we have as a community to um, get off of um, 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 fossil fuels in terms in, for a heating system and also bring our municipal buildings um, off of uh, fossil fuels. Thank you. Council Perry. Thank you. Uh, first, I want to, <clears throat> sorry about that, congratulate Carolyn on this appointment. Uh, though we've not known each other for long, the brief few times that we have met and talked, I really enjoyed our conversations and your passion and understanding about Northampton and its uniqueness. And so I just have, I have two quick questions. Um, and the first is, I, I know there's a lot of changes coming in the near future with our downtown um, and Main Street um, redesigns. And so I was wondering if you, if you had a vision or what, what do you think your role in that or, or 
what your excitement level of helping to guide that is going to be? Sure. Um, <laughs> you know, it's funny, I should have named Picture Main Street as a really exciting project to be working on too, because that's front and center, <laughs> that'll affect everyone. Um, so thank you for bringing that up. It's not that I don't think it's not important. It's just, there's so many fun things that are going on in the city. Um, but Picture Main Street is, um, will be um, a transformative project for the entire community. And um, we're, in fact, today I just had a meeting with our design consultant for that to sort of talk about where we are in the process and sort of what um, the, the timing of design. Um, we, and we're looking at doing a, um, the first major public um, design public hearing is what it's referred to by Mass DOT at the end of October. Um, so I think that um, although that change is going to be enormous for the community um, and that can be very um, uh, concerning for people because of the um, um, sort of shifting sands and not really knowing how it's going to work because it, because the design on the table that we sort of had this really um, um, complicated conversation and complicated meaning um, sometimes is a little messy because it, you know, swings back and forth about sort of what, where we want to be as a community. But I think ultimately it just shows the, the, the community interest in having a say in sort of how we make these changes and change our public spaces. Um, I think that's gonna be um, a, continuing to be a really important conversation and also to connect all of downtown. I think one of the exciting things that um, if you can say that's come out of COVID is sort of rethinking how we use these public spaces in a different way and also thinking about how we connect one side of downtown to the other side and, and the people who have been involved in um, those conversations about sort of pushing our, our um, vision or our idea of what downtown is and what it could be. And so I think that's um, um, a great conversation to continue, sort of how we can take that momentum um, uh, of um, those shared streets and closing Strong um, Avenue and what that means for sort of generating more excitement and interest for people to come downtown and experience downtown. Awesome, thank you. I'm, I too am super excited about downtown. My heart lies in the downtown of the city of Northampton. Um, my second question uh, kind of bounces off the first. Uh, and as we said, we are lucky that in Northampton, we have a lot of chances for the public to give comments or, or put input. And there has been a lot of discussion about communication and how the city communicates what is happening. And uh, I was wondering if you had any thoughts of how you will handle that push and pull of, of public engagement versus getting the work done um, and, and how you envision moving forward with that. Um, there, I, I don't see any significant, I mean, I don't, I don't see, um, significant changes, I guess, in the way that, um, we necessarily, um, would, um, engage public comment. I think it's all, I think, um, I think we've done, we've made a big shift again, because of COVID, we've opened up new opportunities for people to at least listen from, if they can't physically be in the same space as where a public meeting is being held. And I think that's really valuable. I think that it, all, it um, the public engagement um, key component is also variable dependent upon what the situation is. So if it's a, you know, a process, a, a permitting process, let's say, where public in, um, hearings are required, there's a specific way in which that comment has to be taken, which um, is defined. And then there are sort of more open-ended um, public processes. And I think it's important to um, also always 
make sure that people understand how public comment could or might be used and make sure that they're sort of the rules of the conversation and and um, making sure people understand that they're being heard, but maybe um, not all comments might be um, visually seen in the context of a new document that comes out of that hearing. I think it's important to always explain sort of um, what it means when you participate and how that participation is going to be um, included. I don't know if that answers your question. But. No, fine. It was just kind of opening it and wondering. Okay. Uh, and thank you. That, that's all my questions. Again, I'm so glad that for this appointment, couldn't think of anyone better qualified. So, yeah. Thank you. Council LaBarge. Trying to, there we go. There you go, thank you. Um, are we all done with all our questions now, Councillor Foster? But that, that's a question. Um, <laughs> Council, I, I have one one for Carolyn, but um, I, I saw you had your hand up. Did you have another question for her, Councillor? You know what, when you're speaking, your voice is like kind of not connecting good. It's echoing. Oh, okay, and I don't have my headphones handy. Okay. Sorry about that. I will um I will try to speak more clearly and closer. Is that better? Much better. Thank okay. You. All right. Carolyn, my question for you is um you talked about housing, and I think that's a hot topic in Northampton, regardless. So many people are are concerned about the, the just kind of broad increase in the cost of housing, as well as the lack of, of housing, affordable housing isn't the word, but the lack of housing that many people who want to live in Northampton and work in Northampton could afford um, to rent or own. And I know that, you know, when we have these conversations around zoning um, and around planning, very often we're looking people might expect us as a city or as a community to have authority and power that we don't have because of state law, um, that through state law, we can't put um, you know, certain limitations on the building of single family homes and things like that. And I was wondering if you could just talk a little bit about um, what we can do as a community and, and what efforts we can make here in Northampton and then also kind of where that pushes against um, some of the restrictions we have at the state level. Um, yeah, so, um, we definitely have, um, we've tried to, um, walk a fine line in our, in zoning regulation, uh, to, um, incorporate, um, things that we want out of different types of housing. And as you said, um, we aren't allowed to um, regulate um, essentially what's referred to as building code type um, requirements under zoning. And so we don't have a lot of control of what the building code requires. So recently we've been hearing a lot about um, wanting to restrict the type of um, fuel source that is um, allowed to be incorporated in as part of a project and and zoning really can't do that um, but we've sort of worked a way around that by tr by requiring additional permitting so so that it's a, a sort of um, a density bonus if you will sort of the way it looks in a regulatory perspective and that way we can get some of the goodies that we want in terms of um, more building code type things. Um, and, and um, but we don't have a lot of authority. A lot of that is really not a zoning issue. And so, um, but what I think is um, of concern is, is we know we need, we know we need housing. We know we need housing of all different types. And we also want housing to be good, you know, resilient housing that it's, it's built 
for um, the future and it's not built on sort of past um, energy um, system or um, what we're now maybe thinking is sort of the way we need to shift away from. So, um, and, and so I think um, sometimes there's that tension about saying, well, we have, we really know we need this housing, but we don't want it that way. And so we're sort of in this transitional period, I guess, with some types of housing. Um, I wouldn't, I'm not sure that it's so much of an issue um, when we think about more uh, multifamily housing, because we that we can sort of play with a little bit more. I think the other, um, the other issue that's not necessarily about con con conflicts with with regulations, I think we really have an issue with cost of housing and not providing enough of what you've probably heard people refer to as missing middle housing. So it's not single family homes and it's not high rise or multifamily homes or subsidized affordable housing, but it's townhomes or, um, you know, six to eight kind of um, unit homes. And I think it's really important to think about ways that we can build that kind of housing. I heard at, um, I was on a part of a panel discussion about a month or a month and a half ago, and someone from the Eastern part of the state said, you know, that they think that we need to shift our ideas of what starter homes are and that starter homes maybe now aren't single family detached homes because they've become so expensive to build. The land costs are so high that it's just not reachable for people and that we need to think more that starter homes are going to be sort of that missing middle. You, you get into a condominium or a four to six, eight unit apartment rental and then you move to another you know if you are able and want to you can move you know into different housing types but sort of creating um we just think about those paradigm shifts in that we don't have control over their sort of external factors that are changing the way um housing is for all of us in our communities and so i think um that I think that has some validity and it, that it's important to talk about that and what what um, how housing has shifted even just in the last 20 years. I mean, let alone if you take a longer um, um, look at it, but it's not just the cost of construction from COVID, but it's the cost of construction and land costs that have gone up so, so significantly in the last 15 to 20 years. Thanks, Carolyn. I I would just wanted to check uh, um, other counselors on the committee. Did you have other questions or comments? Okay, then uh, Carolyn, thanks thanks so much for your time. Um, the next step is I would entertain a motion for a recommendation. I would like to make a motion um, to forward Carolyn Mesh as director of Office of Planning and Sustainability with a positive, high positive recommendation to full city council. I'll second. second. Oh. oh, all right. Um, Councilor Perry just beat you, Councilor Gore. So motion made by Councilor Labarge and seconded by Councilor Perry. Um, and Laura, would you take a roll call vote, please? Sure. Councilor Foster. Yes. Councilor Gore. Yes. Councilor Labarge. Yes. And Councilor Perry. Yes. <clears throat> Thank you, everyone. So that passes uh, unanimously from the Committee on City Services. Carolyn, nice to see you tonight. Thank you all. Really appreciate it and hope to see you soon. Okay. Uh, so um, what we'll do is we'll take uh, next up on the agenda, item six. This is the items referred to committee. Um, this is the continuation of our discussion from Oh, are we talking June um, on the facial recognition um, technology ordinance? Um, and there was um, a desire from members of the, the council to continue that discussion um, just a, a little bit uh, longer. And so um, really want to thank our guests, um, former Councillor Bill Dwight and from the ACLU, um, Javier, um, Bill Newman and Cade, um, thank you so much for coming. We appreciate it. And um, I would like to start, um, Javier and Cade, we had a chance to hear from you before 
Um, so if you have additional information you'd like to share with us, um, please do. And then um, the reason we invited um, former Councillor Dwight and Bill Newman um, was to have a chance for you to sort of talk about, um, you know, sort of where where the city was at, especially you, Councillor Dwight, um, or kind of what prompted um, the introduction of the ordinance and, and um, that process and also reflections um, a few years out as we're here for review. So maybe start with that chance um, for you to speak and then we'll open up um, to counselors for follow-up questions and clarification. Um, and Javier, I see your hand up if you'd like to start. No, just for the record, I just wanna say, uh, Javier Lundgren from the ACLU Organizing Studies, uh, we have here Kate Crawford, our technology director, and Bill Newman, the legal director of the satellite legal office in our hand, just, just for the record. Thank you. I appreciate that. <laughs> okay. Kate, would, would you like to go ahead? And yes. am I saying your name correctly? Yep. I, it's Kate. I was listening to you, Javier, too. Okay, great. Yep. Um, good evening, everyone. Um, as Javi said, my name is Cade Crawford. I've, I've met many of you before. Um, I run the Technology for Liberty program at the ACLU of Massachusetts. And um, the only update that I can provide that's new information since the last time we spoke to the council about this issue is that um, we made substantial progress at the State House. Um, so initially, in the police reform legislation that was passed in 2020, uh, there were some very initial, we think, inadequate um, reforms uh, implemented to deal with police use of facial recognition. They don't cover schools or any other government agencies, and we think that they fall well short of protecting uh, the public interest. The legislature also created a legislative commission to study what if any additional protections ought to be uh, enacted in, in state law. I served on that commission. That commission reported back to the legislature um, in the spring, what we think are really, really great recommendations. Um, those recommendations were taken up by the Judiciary Committee and the Judiciary Committee in July forwarded uh, favorably reported legislation that mirrors the recommendations that the commission um, put out. And then the House approved that bill in a really impressive, excuse me, bipartisan vote um, on July 21st to attach the legislation to the IT bond bill. Unfortunately, the Senate did not take it up. So um, we are kind of in the same position unfortunately, with respect to state law. Um, our plan now is to ask the legislature to finish the job. We, you know, I'm sure many of you have heard that there remains a lot of unfinished business at the state house, the economic development bill, chief among the issues that the legislature still needs to address before the end of the calendar year. So we do expect them to come back into a formal session to deal with that, you know, the tax issues. Um, and we're gonna be asking the legislature to uh, pass the facial recognition bill that the Judiciary Committee favorably reported, the language that the House approved. Um, if they don't do that th this session, that's gonna be a top legislative priority for the ACLU of Massachusetts um, in January at the beginning of the next legislative session. So, you know, nothing's really changed, unfortunately, with respect to the law, um, but we are working it really hard. and. You know, if any of you uh, would like to help um, letting your state rep and state senator know that, you know, this is an important issue would, would be really, really helpful. So that's all, thanks. Thank you. And former Councilor Dwight. Could you try and do it. it there, okay. Okay. Um, I, just to frame it, give you some context, uh, the, we're, I was originally approached by uh, Bill Newman, actually, in the ACLU, um, suggesting that this be an amplification, essentially, of, of the ordinance that was hard fought to ban municipal oversight and use of any cameras. Um, we, it, it, this was an issue that's 
I, I, personally, I think is uh, ignored at our peril, to be honest. I think that when we uh, make these slow accommodations for uh, privacy violations, it, it, you don't put that toothpaste back in the tube. Particularly with the issue with the facial recognition, by the way, the reason that there's a three-year review in this, and you guys won't have to vote on it only unless you move to change it. <clears throat> but the reason for a third three-year review is because the technology um, changes rapidly, as you can imagine. But uh, I think some of the people who voted in favor of the three-year review because of the technology were thinking it would be improved. My concern was that depending on where you sit, what counts as improvement. Um, one of the, my concerns is advances in biometric analysis. It's not just it's not just facial recognition. It goes to iris scans, to body posture, to composure, your ears, your eyes, everything that you allows you to open up your iPhone and then some. So you, as far as I'm concerned, that's not really an improvement. Um, that's actually a further intrusion. But the, the big concern with facial recognition, the one that actually <clears throat> generates the more appropriate key for the conversation is it has a built-in implicit bias that actually, you know, I'm not sure why, but I would assume it's, you know, data in, data out. It depends who's doing the program. But darker skinned women between 18 and 30 are substantial, like 20 to 30% more likely to be misidentified by facial recognition software. And then it ticks up a little bit better for men, dark skinned men. But it, this is software that favors light-skinned people insofar as that it's more accurate. I, again, how we use the term favor, I'm not sure that's particularly helpful either. So essentially my appeal is to the, the ban that we have is pretty straightforward. Uh, no Northampton government official will employ uh, facial recognition software and if, at any point, this council or future councils consider uh, modifying this in any way, my hope is that they would be inclined to uh, be more robust and expansive in the, in the limitations. Thank you. And Bill Newman, did you want to have a chance to weigh in? We'll ask questions as well, but. Trying to get you the button to say unmute. Laura, could we go ahead and make our guests co-hosts? Oh. Okay, Te technological success. Something that probably ironic in the context of this conversation. But thank you very much. I, I'm happy to spend uh, just a couple minutes, some reflections on the history and the adoption of the face recognition technology ban here in Northampton three years ago. I'd like to emphasize what former, uh, former Councilor Dwight and co-sponsor of this ordinance uh, just said, which is that there's no action necessary by this council. Uh, the uh, final piece of the legislation before Northampton was that there would be a review. It's not a sunset clause. This, this provision, this ordinance will just continue unless the, the, some action is taken. So no action is necessary in order for the ordinance to continue. Uh, it was uh, a matter of some concern, actually, at the last, when the council adopted this uh, ordinance was who would remember? And there was actual considerable discussion of that. I see Councillor Dwight smiling. There was. How are we going to remember to put this on the agenda? And uh, we just kind of figured we would. And in fact, uh, uh, Council now Council President uh, Jim Nash um, made it a point to to remember to make sure this was brought up for uh, review by the council as the ordinance envisioned. Um, my, my reflections on this ordinance is, and I, and I actually take great pride in for what the city did and uh, to the extent I was helpful in that regard, I take pride in that too. And the ACLU's participation, take pride in that as well. 
what's really, I think, is interesting, and I think that speaks so well for Northampton, is the way in which this issue was approached. Um, and I was extremely impressed by the work that uh, Councillor uh, Dwight did on this bill, that the uh, now mayor did as a sponsor of this bill, um, and that uh, Councillor Klein did. They were enormously informed. They read a lot. They had really insightful questions, and they worked very hard on the drafting of, of the bill, of the ordinance, um, and made it better. Uh, there's a certain uh, drafting beauty here uh, in the simplicity of this ordinance. It didn't, uh, all, the, all the variations and iterations were not so straightforward and simple, but in fact, they came up with, and we came up uh, with an ordinance, I think, that really does address the issues in a significant and for the time comprehensive way. Uh, and that actually, I think significantly involved the, if not unanimity, at least something close to a consensus of what was good for the community, best for the community, helpful for uh, uh, public safety and in the interests of everyone in the community. Uh, I had meetings with many counselors um, and I had three meetings with the police chief um, who was, we had a frank, full and frank uh, sharing of views. Um, and I think that the community actually came together and the counselors who sponsored this came together and said, is there something here that in fact reflects the values of the community and is workable for us? This was only the third community in the state to take up this kind of an ordinance and the first in Western Massachusetts. And I think the care that was put into this endeavor, the uh, insight, the research, and that effort I think was reflected in an ordinance that has stood the test of time. Uh, I, I think the community can be proud of this ordinance and the council can be proud of this ordinance um, and that the fact that there is no, I think, necessity at this point to reform or change the ordinance uh, speaks well for that initial effort and the success that it has had. And I'd be happy to answer any questions if anyone has any with regard to the uh, process itself. And I wanna thank the council for your consideration, for your looking into this again, and hopefully for allowing the ordinance to continue as it has been. Javier. Yeah, um, yeah. I, I just want to sort of. I'm not going to say again what Kate said or Bill said because I totally I, I agree with it. What I want to say, December 2019 was a pretty uh, productive month for the Northampton City Council, and specifically, if you take a look to the to two ordinances that passed that that month, those two ordinances were. Um, sponsored by Councilor Klein, Councilor Dwight, and then Councilor Shara, which was the welcoming city ordinance in December 5th, and the ban on the use of official surveillance in December 19th, right? And, you know, that sort of shows how proactive the Northampton City Council has been in, in things in Western Mass that had become relevant, right? After Northampton would follow East Hampton, and after East Hampton would follow Springfield, banning the the use of facial surveillance technology by any city department, right? Um, and we already mentioned the last time that we talked about this, the fact that the language of the welcoming city ordinance um, influenced high, greatly the language of the ban on the use of facial surveillance, which is you know the, the fact that the position of the city stating that the city council cannot tell city officers what to do or not to do, right? And that, that's important to remember it. And what Jeff Napolitano and myself came out in that point was, you know, no city resources should be used in the acquisition, et cetera, et cetera. And I think that that's a, that being able to work that with Bill Dwight, being able to work that with well, Lisa Klein, with, with uh, uh, the mayor, Chara, that was, that was extremely telling of the steps that then the, the city was taking in the middle of, of uh, you know, a pretty aggressive administration 
in Washington to protect people locally. And that sort of is, is a testament of that, right? We, all, we hear a lot in the advocacy that the ACLU does that, you know, there the are matters that the federal government has to take hands on. But the reality, when we find ourselves in context such as the one that we find with the previous uh, occupant of the White House, Northampton was able to take a step forward and proactively uh, being able to protect their community and the residents. So councillors on the committee, do you have um, follow-up questions or clarification? Councillor Gore. Um, I, I think the ordinance is great and I think it does protect the community of Northampton. And um, I know that um, Bill Newman said that, you know, it could stay as is, but I, I wonder if three years later, if there's anything that you guys think technology wise or in any way that it needs to be more robust or anything like that. I mean, it seems fine as is, but I'm, I'm just curious about technology wise. Sorry, I was caught reading. Councilor Dwight, former Councilor Dwight. That guy, while well, you unmute, I'll keep going. Good night. There we go. Uh, thank you, Councilor Gore. That, that, that kind of was a springboard off of what I said at the end. And I, I don't think now, because we don't, I don't, I don't know if you have or if there is available and Cade can be more helpful with this ultimately, but what <clears throat> what level the technology has reached and achieved and Lord knows what's going on in back rooms and in various software development firms. The, and actually, I want to also refer to something that Javier mentioned, which is you'll notice this is not banning the police from use of this because he's right. Uh, that's an administrative or an executive order. The executive can lay down those policies for the department. Instead, we made a universal ban, as we did with the cameras. This is something that we sussed out when we had the, the hammer and tong battle over uh, limiting cameras. And the concern there was also changing technology. But that would, it became evident that if we make a universal ban over any Northampton municipal authority having any control over a camera within limitations. There are certain um, uh, uh, applications that can that need to be approved and are only temporary. And the same thing with uh, facial software. Um, I actually am grateful for this analysis. I was wondering, I, you know, it was when we threw in this three-year review thing, it was kind of a feel-good thing on some level, but it, it actually helped pass it on some level too. And it, as you note, um, Javier mentioned it was December 19th. You'll all know that our term ends just a few weeks after that, and we were really down to it. Um, and there was going to be a new session with a new council. So uh, I was particularly grateful that the council responded as quickly and as thoughtfully as they did. I think that if we wait another three years, hopefully we will have a much broader understanding about what specificity we can include in the law in order to provide expanding protections. I am worried about how it's used, but truth be told, Northampton Police Department never had facial recognition software, really didn't have any intention of buying it, but at the same time, they liked having the option of its availability and we just basically denied them that option. And you don't make laws and ordinances for the people who are sitting in a Zoom meeting or the people who are currently in the offices that they sit in. You make it for some imaginary person. And, you know, who would have pictured Donald Trump as president of the United States at some point? So basically, you make the laws and hopefully they conform to them. So I think that was a long way of saying. I think it's worthy of actually in the intervening three years, if you, and I'd be glad to help with this, commit to a, a deeper analysis of this ordinance and see what we can do to strengthen it and make it more uh, sturdy. But right now, um, there's nothing to propose. And I would, I would suggest you do as 
uh, Javier and Cade and Bill have also said was just to um, accept the fact that it's still a viable and workable ordinance and that doesn't need change right now. Thank you. And Kate, did you want to weigh in? I was just going to say, no, I don't think that the ordinance needs to be amended in light of any um, technological changes at the moment. I'm going to, um, Council Labar, just your hand, I'm going to jump in with, with just one thing, which is that um, just noting, actually, if we don't make any changes to the ordinance, then there's not a mechanism for future review. So um, I, I just wanted to bring that up or hear from um, from others as well. If we just need to amend um, to to plan for a future review again as technology continues um, to evolve. So um, just wanted to put that on the floor and and um, just because that was coming up. Um, yes, Bill. Thank you for that. I mean, you know, actually, it's been a while since I read this. I thought it was every three years, but I guess it's not. It's only the first initial three years. So, um, but as Bill Newman pointed out in our original debate, we couldn't really figure out how you red flag something like that or get something to, some kind of a tickler that pops up so Laura or whomever gets to see that, hey, wait a minute, you, this is something you guys have to do. Um, but I do think that's an appropriate amendment. Uh, Javier. Um, yeah, certainly. So the, the language reads that three years from the month of enactment of this ordinance, the ordinance shall be placed in the agenda of the City Council for review. But the reality is that um, sort of uh, uh, that over there is just a snooze, right? It's just for the first three years to come. But that the reality, the council has the power as the legislative body to bring any issue in any ordinance for review. Um, so I, I, you know, I wouldn't be worried about that specifically. Bill. Ah. Okay, there we go. On that point, um, that's true, except I like the idea of a review because when we're doing reactionary law or responding to a crisis as it presents or something that's problematic as it presents as opposed to prophylactic law, which this would be if you do every three months review, uh, it would give you time to digest it more as opposed to crafting something that needs to be done quicker than not. Because I mean, I, don't, I, I think we all appreciate what this means for privacy and for individual privacy and and integrity of law enforcement. And I, I would just assume, you know, I, I don't see the harm in throwing in a three uh, year review and um, as opposed to having them, you know, within a year's time, some crisis has presented itself and you have to react to that. Javier. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, if you see it through that lens, it makes sense. And, you know, if, if the state council would opt into making sort of a, you know, a cycle of it, uh, that we would be okay with that, obviously. And Councilor LaBerge, thank you for indulging me. I, I saw you had your hand up. Did you have a question? Uh, you're muted, hang on, let's get you unmuted. Thank you. Um, I want to thank Councillor Dwight for being here this evening. And I was in full support as a city councilor when this ordinance came in front of us. And it was something that I felt was in dire need. And yes, both Bill Dwight, Councillor Dwight, and Councillor Gina LaShiera. And Alyssa Klein, and it's too bad Alyssa is not here this evening because she put a lot of effort into it also. So I think we should leave it as it is with the three years and just see how things are going, how technology will improve and so forth. So 
I want to thank Bill for you being here and also for Bill Newman for being here, because to me, this space surveillance system and this ordinance is extremely valuable to everybody, for everybody. And I think it gives everybody in diversity some safety here in our community. So thank you, Bill Dwight, for being here and Bill Newman. Uh, uh, Bill Newman. Yeah, 30 seconds just to emphasize that if this were to be adopted um, with this suggestion that has been made about a three re review, just to be clear when it comes from your committee, that this is in no way a sunset provision. This in no way requires any action. It's just for review because technology can change, but it does not require the council to do anything. And without any action, the ordinance will just stay in effect like any other ordinance on the books in the city. Yep. Thank you. Uh, so if I may weigh in for just a second. So it might make sense then um, from what I'm hearing to consider amending it. And the way it was written originally was just for a three-year review from the month of enactment of this ordinance, but perhaps to- for Three years. Yeah, to, to work on language that would call for ongoing reviews. If, if three years feels like an appropriate time period, I. Cade, maybe this is more your wheelhouse to think of what an appropriate time period it would be, um, you know, and, and that's something that that we can consider. So not at the moment, what I'm hearing is a des not a desire from the council or for the original um, people who worked on this ordinance to change the substance of the ordinance, but to consider just the review period. Um, I do personally, as a council, I find this discussion to be really helpful and particularly helpful in that we're not uh, facing a crisis, so to speak, that this is uh, preventative. And, and um, so we'd just love to hear your thoughts on that, kid. Sorry, I thought you'd be able to unmute. No, it's fine. <laughs> okay, it's fine. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, I, I kind of share Javi's initial inkling that it doesn't seem to me to be strictly necessary to amend the ordinance. I, I mean, I think that the council can have a conversation about any ordinance that's on the books at any time. Um, but if folks feel more comfortable with uh, amending the ordinance so that there is you know, a legal requirement to have that conversation, I think three years is appropriate. And so you know, an amendment to just say that you know, every three years, the council will have a discussion about um, the, the implementation of the ordinance, uh, that makes sense to me. Yeah. Thank you. And other counselors on the committee, do you have other, other questions? No. no. Okay. And other, um, of our guests, thank you so much for being here, by the way, on, on primary election and Laura and I talked, so we're just making a recommendation. It was just a discussion. There's not a binding vote on today's agenda. So I just wanted to be clear about that. Um, but but to our guests um, who are here with us, do you have any other additional thoughts you want to be sure that that we hear from you? No, I just say thank you to everyone here and to everyone who's worked on this. It's a really important issue. So we at the ACLU appreciate all your work. Thanks. Thank you. Great. Uh, Javier. Yeah, and just just to mention, um, uh, Rep. Sabadosa and Senator Comerford have been extremely supportive. Uh, in Boston and legislature of this issue. Uh, and they have worked uh, extremely hard on this. And we really appreciate the work that they have been doing, advocating for this issue and other issues that they ACLU has been working really hard on. And also, I just wanna say, um, as, as a, we can suggest language for you. And the ACs, the ACs have in mind if you, if the members of the committee have the language in front of them, would be enough to add every three years starting from the month of enactment of this ordinance, this ordinance shall be placed. It's that it's such it's such a simple change, right? Uh, starting with every three years starting from the month of enactment of this ordinance, blah, blah, blah. It's, it's, mm -hmm. it's this tiny, simple change that we can recommend you. Okay. 
great. And and actually, I guess this, this is a, a more of a process question. Um, Laura, or Javier, or, or Bill Dwight, you might be able to help with this. Um, to um, For a committee to recommend an amendment to an ordinance, do we just bring it back to council as is um, with the, the previous sponsors and all of that, just with a, an amendment recommended? Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Oh, great. All right, then thank you so much to our guests on this very rainy Tuesday. I, I appreciate both your patience with rescheduling this meeting and also your, um, you know, what you what we've all done in our days to be here this evening. So thank you so much. I, I really, really appreciate your time. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks. Um, so that brings us, we're going to jump back to, um, where are we at? Item four, which is the minutes of previous meetings. We have the minutes from June 13th and July 25th. Um, we could do a motion to approve them as a group if there are no um, amendments. Of June 13th and July 25th, 2022. Okay. Okay, motion made by Councillor Labarge and seconded by Councillor Gore. Um, Laura, can you do a roll call vote on that? Councillor Foster. Yes. Councillor Gore. Yes. Councillor yes. Labarge. Yes. And Councillor Perry. Yes. Okay, great. Then um, let's go to appointments to various committees. These were all referred to city council um, at our August meeting. Um, we'll go, we'll just go in order um, unless somebody has a compelling reason not to. Um, so first up with the Board of Assessors is um, Sean Sullivan and Council Labarge, I believe that was you. Yes, thank you. Okay. Um, let me get my paper. Attorney Sean Sullivan, I had uh, a good talk with him and he's a very, very reputable real estate attorney in the city of Northampton. Sean has Attorney Sullivan has submitted an application to serve on the Board of Assessors, and he is very, very interested in serving the city in this capacity. He is in the real estate attorney with 20 years of experience. Real estate law is his primary practice area. He's also had occasions to deal with different boards of assessors over many times in practice. He believes that his experience can be of assistance in filling this role, and he is ready to learn whatever else is necessary. And he is saying that he, it is the, his understanding that there will be an online course that he would have to take if appointed. He's not aware of any changes that are needed to the Board of Assessors, but this mostly based um, I having not served that role, Sean is very, very interested in serving on the Board of Assessors. I would like to move forward the recommendation of Attorney Sean Sullivan to the Board of Assessors with a positive recommendation to full City Council. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. Okay, Councilor Gore. She, she got unmuted first, Councilor Perry. Um, so motion made for a positive recommendation <laughs> made by Councilor Labarge, seconded by Councilor, Le, Councilor Gore. Um, any discussion on the appointment of Sean Sullivan to the Board of Assessors? Just jump in briefly to say I, I have known Sean for years and Northampton is lucky to have him um, put his name forward for service. So I'm grateful to that. Um, Laura, if you could do a roll call. Councillor Gore. Yes. Councillor Labarge. Yes. Councillor Perry. Yes. And Councillor Foster. Yes. Okay, so that uh, motion for a positive recommendation passes. And next up is the appointment of Janet Grant to the Board of Health. Um, that was me. Um, and I, I see Janet here as well, which is great. Um, Janet and I talked over the weekend. Um, she lives at Village Hill and um, has 
uh, connected with another member of the Board of Health. Um, the Board of Health is a five member body and um, maintaining um, full membership of the Board of Health is really important as they've been just working so hard and making so many really important decisions uh, for the city, um, particularly during this time. And, and when they drop below five members, that, that makes it challenging for the Board of Health. So I just wanted to put that out there. Um, Jana has extensive um, related experience um, with public health. Um, she's put together certification programs at Holyoke Community College for certified nursing assistants and community health workers. Um, has worked on curriculum to align community health workers program with state requirements, uh, has coordinated certification programs for medical assistants and billers and coders, um, started an app for medical assisting um, to be started an application for the medical assisting program there to be certified by certifying organizations. Um, she's worked at the state level on tobacco control, um, has also worked in um, you know, issues affecting not only teens, but um, general population as well, um, drug abuse prevention, uh, regional technology assistance and trainings, um, uh, osteoporosis, teen pregnancy, prostate cancer. Um, she's been interested in serving on the Board of Health for a long time and had actually applied uh, several years ago. And then, um, you know, that was not asked to fill that vacancy um, and reapplied and, um, it, is enthusiastic about the role that the Board of Health can play in Northampton and brings um, a really interesting knowledge in community health and public health um, that could be a tremendous asset to the board. Uh, so with that, I would uh, move a positive recommendation for Janet Grant's application to the Board of Health. Second it. Okay, so motion made by me and seconded by Councilor Labarge. Is there any discussion on this? Okay, um, Laura, could you call a roll call? Uh, do a roll call vote, please. Councillor Labarge. Yes. Councillor Perry. Yes. Councillor Foster. Yes. And Councillor Gore. Yes. Okay, so that, that motion passes unanimously. Um, next up is um, Beverly Bates to the Community Preservation Committee as the Housing Partnership Representative. And excuse me, I'm pulling up my notes for who is going to speak with whom, but... Um, Feel free to jump in before me as well. <laughs> it's my turn. Okay, Council Labarge, you're up. Thank you. Thank you saved you. me. Um, Beverly Bates. Um, Beverly Bates is unbelievable here. You know, um, she has worked in the field of housing and community development for over 40 years and retired two years ago from the position of Executive Vice President for Development at the Community Builders, one of the nation's largest developers and managers of affordable and mixed income housing. In that capacity, she oversaw a staff of 60 development, construction and financial staff working in 14 states. Not only did Bubbly did we build high quality affordable rented housing, but the community builders specialize in the following, re redevelopment of distressed neighborhoods, renovation or reconstruction of distress, SA and public housing, structuring complex financing and raising public and private resources, development of mixed income housing in an effort to create economic diversity development of affordable home ownership, development of mixed use buildings involving retail or other services, provisions of comprehensive resident and community engagement services. Beverly has also worked for and with many community-based nonprofit organizations, as well as federal, state, and local government. As a resident of Northampton, she is keenly aware of the high cost of both rental and ownership housing. She also very much values our community's commitment to preserve open space, natural resources, and neighborhoods. Beverly believes it is both necessary and possible to construct and renovate housing 
which meets the higher standards for energy efficient. So finally, one of her reasons that she lives in Northampton is its commitment to equity and diversity. As a member of the CPC, she would contribute her many, many knowledge and experience to help and further the objectives of the Community Preservation Act and ensuring that CPA funds are spent in a way that leverages other resources and maximize benefit for the community. I also serve on the Northampton Housing Partnership and have observed the need for more collaborative by the numerous actors and organizations affecting housing and preservation activities. She looks forward to working together with all those players to help further a strategic and effective agenda for increasing the supply of affordable housing while preserving all that is wonderful about life in Northampton. I would like to make a motion to move forward the recommendation of Beverly Bates to the Community Preservation Committee with a positive recommendation to full city council. A second. Okay, motion made by Council Labarge and seconded by Councilor Perry. Is there any discussion on this? Okay, Laura, if you could do a roll call. Councilor Perry. Yes. Councilor Foster. Yes. Councilor Gore. Yes. And Councilor Labarge. Yes. Okay, thank you. That one passes unanimously as well. Um, and next up is the Historical Commission with um, Greg and Councilor Gore. I don't know if you helped, if you got the pronunciation on the last name, De Debrindisi? Debrindisi, I think. Okay. I think yeah. Um, so he wants to be, uh, he's applying to be the realtor rep from uh, the Realtor Association of the Pioneer Valley. He was born and raised here in Northampton. He was a volunteer firefighter 30 years ago here in the city. Um, he thinks it's important to continue the realtor rep seat. Um, he's self-employed, so he'll be able to make the meetings. And since he's a realtor, he understands how the commissions operate. And he knows a lot about the homes in Northampton. He is interested in keeping the older stock, the historic homes. Um, he lives in Ward 1, where there's not many historic homes. Um, but he says there's a lot of historic homes in South Street. There's some homes that were built in the 1700s and some older homes in Leeds. Um, and he says the older homes have more solid material that they're made out of. And he wants to see our history preserved. And he also believes we need uh, lower income housing. Um, from all his experience in, in real estate and all his time living in Northampton and his interest in preserving you know, the history of Northampton, um, I'd like to make a positive recommendation for him to be on the historical commission as the realtor rep. Second. Okay, motion made by Councilor Gore and seconded by Councilor Labarge. Any discussion? Okay, Laura, we can do a roll call. Councillor Foster. Yes. Councillor Gore. Yes. Councillor Labarge. Yes. And Councillor Perry. Yes. Okay, that one passes unanimously. Um, next up for the Human Rights Commission, uh, we had the appointment of Diana Stallone to consider. Yes, was... and I had the pleasure of talking with Diana Stallone uh, for a long time. You know, sometimes these conversations are quick and we were on the phone for over 35 minutes. Um, it was really informative. <clears throat> Diana grew up in the city of Minneapolis uh, where she actually was a civil rights commissioner and I found out that their civil rights commission has a, a, a different mandate than our human rights commission. Um, but a lot of what she did was hear testimonies of discrimination cases from um, you know, people with disabilities, African-Americans, um, a, a huge Native American indigenous population. Um, and so through that, she got to see kind of what the problems were with the city. One of the things that really struck her was recently the murder of George Floyd in Minneapolis. Um, she actually lived on that same block many, many years ago. And to see that things really hadn't changed struck her deeply. Um, 
Diana has been an attorney for over 25 years. She's lived in Northampton for 20 of those. Um, and she's really focused on human and civil, human and civil rights cases. Um, she has been both uh, the attorney for defense and for plaintiffs. So she's seen both sides and really understands what perspective is. Um, and she, she has had a front row, row view of the justice system. And the thing that really stuck out to me was that Diana is also an artist. Um, and she made sure to, to note that being an artist, uh, she understands that sometimes you need to have um, a bit of creativity and, and that side of the brain to think outside the box and apply that to solving problems, which I feel really does fit in with the city of Northampton and our love of the arts and culture. Um, she decided to apply because she's looking to wind down her legal practice. For years, she was a single mom dealing with her child plus her business, the dogs, um, and also art. And she didn't really feel like she had the time to give back to the community. Although we discussed the fact that her uh, advocacy work and uh, her work with her practice really is uh, community-based. Um, so she feels now that this is a great time to get involved in the city of Northampton. Um, she's also had the, the pleasure of running a business in East Hampton. She had a restaurant, East Village, I think it was called. Um, but I bring that up because one of the things that she wanted to do was uh, really look into bringing in the community, whether it's having spoken word nights, uh, live performances, plays, things like that. So she really is looking holistically as Northampton, um, as, you know, as a, as a place where you have to be involved in the community. Um, and then the thing that really stood out for me is that Diana understood that here in Northampton, uh, we are very lucky to have some pretty solid policies. Um, you know, the officials who work for the city are, for the most part, wonderful folks. And, um, you know, she even stated that the, our police force is, in comparison to other places like Minneapolis, a lovely police force. Um, and so she's interested in working in an environment where we have so many benefits and seeing what more she can do to benefit human rights in our um, city and our community. And again, I think that not only is she well qualified, but she really embodies kind of the ethos of Northampton. So I will move forward with a positive recommendation for Diana. I can it. Okay, any discussion on this? Thank you, Councilor Perry, for that, that summary. Um, Appreciate it. Uh, Laura, um, can we do a roll call? Sure. Councilor Gore. Yes. Councilor Labarge. Yes. Councilor Perry. Yes. And Councilor Foster. Yes. Okay, thank you. And that brings us to our final new appointment, which is for Angela D'Souza, um, to also to the Human Rights uh, Commission. Yep, so I talked to Angela. Um, she uh, is a public school teacher in Holyoke. She's lived here for six years and she likes this community because she feels really rooted here and like you can contribute to the community here. Unlike where she lived before in New, in New Orleans and she lived in New York City, which is you know, a big city. She felt like she couldn't really contribute in the same ways that she can contribute to a smaller area like this one. Um, she met with the uh, human rights uh, chair of the Human Rights Commission and talked to her about, um, you know, the Human Rights Commission and was interested in joining. And um, she's been on a diversity and equity team in Springfield to embed anti-racism in the cur curriculum. Um, she's on the board of the River Valley Co-op. Um, she says it's a talented and diverse board and she's happy to be a part of it. Um, she believes in diversity, inclusion, justice, equity, um, and thinking about um, those things in her teaching and how she relates to students. And right now she's teaching ethnic studies and she wants students to bring their identity into the classroom. And she thinks that's important um, for, for history and ethnic studies. Um, and uh, she works in the diversity department at Smith. Um, she got her master's in teaching there, um, and she believes um, in liberatory education. Um, 
And yeah, I just, uh, I think she would be a good fit for the Human Rights Commission um, because she believes in diversity and equity and inclusion and justice. She's very justice oriented. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, I was very impressed with her, her all that she has done. And um, she thought about um, possibly being on school committee one day, um, but she's saying that's still a thought. Um, but yeah, I would, I would positively recommend her to the Human Rights Commission. I move to positively recommend her. I'll second it. Okay, motion made by Councilor Gorin, seconded by Councilor Labarge. Um, any discussion on that motion? Okay, um, Laura, roll call. Councilor Labarge. Yes. Councilor Perry. Yes. Councilor Foster. Yes. And Councilor Gore. Yes. Okay, that one passes unanimously, which brings us up to a reappointment of um, Thomas Dunphy to the Parks and Recreation Commission. A process note, we don't typically interview or report back on reappointments. Uh, so I would entertain a motion um, for a recommendation. I'll make a motion to recommend Thomas Dunphy. Thank you, Councilor Perry. Second. Okay, motion made by Councilor Perry and seconded by Councilor Gore. And roll we'll call on, on that appointment, Laura. Councillor Perry. Yes. Councillor Foster. Yes. Councillor Gore. Yes. And Councillor Labarge. Yes. Okay. That, thank you, everyone. Um, and that brings us up to, um, I believe we've gone through everything there. That brings us up to item seven, uh, new business. And I, I know for sure that Councillor Labarge had an item of new business um, she'd like to discuss. Um, so this is an opportunity to to bring things up that are not on the agenda. Thank you very much, Councillor Foster. Um, I have asked our chair of city service that I would really like to have city service definitely, definitely seriously look at what is happening here in our city of Northampton. The outcry, the outcry that is happening with the amount of dispensaries occurring throughout the city and now just recently in Florence. What I am asking as a city service committee that we look at doing and having a round table. I think it's time. In 2018, that was before. Now this is 222. We need to move on. And what I'm asking is, and please hear what I have to say. I would like us. Oh, I think you just accidentally hit the mute button, Council Labarge. Let's turn on. We'll get you unmuted again. I don't know, Karen, what's going on. I, I think when you shuffled your papers, um, oh, a button be. got pushed. Yeah. Right there. Okay. What I'm asking for that we do a round table. And we've done this a long time ago with a round table and it's very successful, believe me, it is. I would like to us and have our chair notify Heather Warner, who's the coordinator of the Smithy Coalition Group. Very knowledgeable. And I think with all the research that she's been doing would be excellent to have her come in and speak with us. I also would like to have, um, I got them all written down here, is um, Ananda Lennox. She's chair of the Northampton Prevention Coalition through Zippy. And I know the two of them like to work together I've been told this and that they really go out and do education on what we're gonna be talking about, which is the amount of marijuana dispensaries in this city with capping. Also, I would like us to invite our commissioner, Meredith O'Leary, and also a member from the Board of Health. I also feel we should look at asking either our um, chief of police, Jody Casper, 
if not a police officer on public safety. I think this would be very educational for everybody with open public session, questions that we can present to who we're inviting to attend this, and let's open it up on discussion. It's very, very serious now. As a counselor for a long period of time, I can't tell you the calls I get. My last call on Friday night was 1.30 in the morning. It was nonstop. I don't mind it because this is a critical thing right now, but when you have family in that, it really is, it makes a difference. But please look at this very, very carefully because we are the legislative branch. We have people who are telling us, many, many, who are telling us what is needed now, not in 2018, but now. And I think you all are hearing it. And I know even with Councilor um, Jamila Gore, she had mentioned about the need that has to be done with capping. And I'm gonna back her 100% on that because it's become very, very out of control here in the city of Northampton. Either we do something about this and go in the right direction. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Councilor Labarge. Um, I'll, other counselors, I'll, I'll give you a chance to, to jump in for a second as well. I. I also agree on the importance of the committees taking a look at this issue. The only thing I wanna be mindful of is we do um, have the chair of the community resources committee in the room, which is great. Um, so uh, something for us to consider is either, either a joint meeting like we did, and I'd love to hear thoughts um, uh, about a year and a half ago regarding the issue of homelessness. My concern is that that sometimes when we invite a lot of people, it can become slightly unwieldy and give us less of a chance to dive into the issues. Or we could consider um, speaking with Northampton department heads and employees um, to your list, Councilor Labarge, I would add Sean Donovan from the Department of Community Care as well. Um, and then um, the... Heather Warner and Ananda Lennox, who are with Spiffy, may, may be more appropriately under the purview of um, Community Resources Committee. Um, but Councilor Perry, as, as you're here, I don't want to put you in the spot because you haven't met with your committee yet, I don't believe, but I just wanted to put that out there. Yes, so I think, and, and um, you, you put it well, is that I think we should really focus on some of the city services, um, you know, department heads and whatnot in this committee. Um, my plan after meeting with the vice chair of community resources is to offer a look at some uh, community-based organizations, but also um, maybe see if I can get um, people who represent the dispensaries. Um, you know, while we've had heard some, some people who have had outcry, we have to remember that we are a large city. Um, you know, we have, close to 30,000 people here. And, you know, the, the amount of people who have spoke up are nowhere near that. Um, so there's a lot of people who haven't spoken and one side of the community are the people who are running these businesses. Uh, I know an, while some of them are from outside of this city, there are a number of folks who are running dispensaries who have run other businesses here, other restaurants, other, other establishments. So I think that my plan for community resources is to reach out to those folks I did have Sean Donovan kind of earmarked, but I feel like he could work on both. Um, one of the reasons why I would like him in community resources is that a lot of what his focus has been is on outreach and education about substance abuse. And so I think that he is uniquely suited to fit in both, um, you know, both for working for the city, but also being really intimately entwined with, um, with that. So, uh, that, you know, that's that's where I am. I think that having, I don't think a joint meeting would serve our purposes well. I think it could be just a long kind of drawn out thing. Um, and, I, and I also see this as an issue that we're going to, you know, we're going to take into our committees, we can report and people can go back and digest each piece uh, separately. And then for the broader council, we'll all have more information. Exactly. Thanks, Thank Councilor Perry. Yep. 
Um, Councilor Gore, did you want to weigh in? Um, I just, I think, I, I think both Councilor Perry and Councilor Labarge have good ideas about how to proceed with the discussion. Okay. Um, so then Laura and I, based on, on what I've heard, um, and, and Sean may just be like the guest of the hour, but um, we can work together to reach out to um, Chief Casper, um, Commissioner O'Leary, whether it's her, or there's somebody more appropriate from the health department. Kara, I see you here, so I'm gonna <laughs> come back to you. Um, Sean Donovan, and then also um, the Board of Health. Um, in the meantime, counselors, if you have somebody that you'd like um, to hear from as well, reach out to, to Laura and I as we put this together. And Kara, I'm gonna guess that you have some information that may be relevant. So I'm gonna come to you and then back to you, Councilor Labarge. Yes, question. Um, so what you're saying is that you, you do not think that we should have um, from Sniffy to come in to um, city service to talk with us when they have so much research being done that I think is very valuable. They have they have tremendous resource and access to information, but I, I think in the purviews of the committee um, that, that Spiffy would fall under the community resources committee as they're not a city oh. service. Um, but I, I absolutely uh, Councillor Perry will put that plug in that we should be hearing from Spiffy, and I know they I so. they have a data sharing event coming up at the end of September. Um, I just saw that email today. Right, because they do oh, yes. work under the city. Yeah. Um, yeah. No, they're they're separate. Uh, Kara, it, <laughs> what's what's relevant? What you got for us? Hi, hi, I'm Kara McLaughlin. I work for the City Health Department, and I run the Northampton. Um, prevention Coalition, which is a primary prevention coalition, and so currently I'm. I wasn't intending to participate as a city member, but I don't think I can take that hat off at this moment because I also live in Florence, 241 Spring Street and have a third grader at Leeds. Um, so talking with my city hat on, this is unofficial uh, me commenting, but there are um, Commissioner O'Leary and I ha are trying to get together and um, Heather Warner from Spiffy and Caroline Johnson, the epidemiologist there, our hard cr crunching numbers from the data, the prevention needs assessment data that was um, delivered or administered in 2022, um, this past spring. And um, so that is in process. There's a lot of kind of policy around who can share data. And we have to make sure that we're making on the up and up of making sure that we've crossed our T's and dotted our I's around who's getting what data and how and um, with the superintendent and um, what else should I say? And I just wanted to just say that like the teen health survey data is a survey that goes to eighth, 10th and 12th graders. And, you know, in, um, in um, centering equity, we wanna make sure that like survey, we, there's, a, there's um, um, bringing awareness to not putting too much stock just in these checkbox survey data, it's very important, but it's not the be all and end all of what is actually happening for young people in our community. And I'd also like to say that Spiffy has been going through a really deep um, needs assessment that includes focus grouping with young people and parents this past year, and that the Northampton Prevention Coalition that we've been meeting with young people in the school system. So there's a lot more than just finding out what the per the um, prevention needs assessment says, which I think, so as we're all kind of waiting for the data, mm -hmm. I think it's a bigger conversation of lessons learned from other states and what's happened, mm -hmm. who have been doing this for, have this happening for longer. And also to, um, to look at how other substances have impacted communities over time. So um, to be continued, I guess is the, the short answer. So, but there is a lot of really hard working, intelligent um, people that care so much about these subjects, including Sean, who I share an office with, um, Sean Donovan. And so, um, yeah, we really hope to have a really robust, uh, transparent conversation with all of you. Thank you, Kara, for jumping in. Thank um, you. Yeah, appreciate it. That's our hope as well. So. Um, you know, the conversation is to be continued. Um, 
no great conversation yeah, happens in Sydney. totally so to be continued and I think um, yeah and just I think sometimes I may come on with my kind of resident parent hat on and sometimes I'll come on with my Department of Health and Human Services. And right now it was like kind of an unofficial Department of Health and Human <laughs> Services, but I knew that you were all talking about this and felt silly to not to, to give you some information that's happening. Thank you. That was helpful. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah. Um, so city services committee, committee members, we will see this issue on our October agenda um, with the, the folks that, that we just discussed now. Um, we'll reach out to and, and hope that they're available. Um, but in the meantime, if there's more from the city services angle that you think about after today, um, you know, reach out to Laura and I, um, but, but we will explore, begin, I'm not even going to promise explore, we will begin exploring this issue at our October meeting. Councilor LaBarge. Yes, could you just repeat again, please? Oh, sure. Um, so Laura, you and I will reach out to Chief Casper, Commissioner O'Leary, Director Donovan, um, I think it's Chair Levin from the Board of Health. Um, we'll start there and, and whether they are the most appropriate person or there's somebody more appropriate, um, we'll, we'll um, invite in our, our city resources um, to discuss this issue with us in October. So we have Chief Casper and Sean Donovan, Board of Meredith Health. Meredith O'Leary. Okay. You had mentioned the Board of Health, Councilor Labarge. Did, yes, did you want us to reach out to the Board of Health? Yep. And the Board of Health. Yep. Thank you. And what I'm hearing is that in community resource, they are looking at bringing in Stiffy. Is that correct, Councilor Perry? Yes, I, I, I think that would be a great space for them to speak. Okay, thanks. And share I, think it, I think it's good here too. <laughs> They're excellent. Thanks, Councillor Perry. Okay, um, so that brings us up. I apologize, I didn't catch the note. Oh, wait, back to my agenda. Number eight um, is one, one last agenda item oh. I would entertain a motion for. I'll make a motion to adjourn. Thank you, Councillor Perry. Second it. Okay, so motion to adjourn made by Councillor Perry, seconded by Councillor Labarge. Uh, roll call vote on adjournment. Councillor Foster. Yes. Councillor Gore. Yes. Councillor Labarge. Yes. And Councillor Perry. Yes. Councillor okay. Jamila Gore, have a safe trip tomorrow. Oh, thank you. And Where are you going, Councillor Gore? I forgot. I'm going I to France you. to visit my brother. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. Enjoy. Have a yeah. wonderful time. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Have a safe. Thanks. Right. Um, Good night, Council everyone. Councillor oh, Foster, I just wanted yes. to mention Legislative Matters has rescheduled their October meeting because they were, it fell on Columbus Day, Indigenous Peoples Day. Yes. They're proposing to meet at um, 6 on October 3rd. So I'm just, you know, it's, it's just occurring to me generally these meetings. Let city services only meets for an hour. So I was thinking that that was going to be okay. Wait, I'm wait, just wait. wondering if I should either ask them to meet a little later or if it's possible okay. that this committee could meet a little earlier. So it's just as of now, they had to reschedule because of the holiday. And they have a public hearing which hasn't been advertised yet. So I can still change the time of their meeting. They have, oh, what is it? Um, the Prince Street rezoning. Yeah, that's here. That might draw some people. And they have the parking oh, reg up, update. That's okay. the other thing. I thought they had their schedule for September 19th. It's not on their agenda. To well, that's community resource. They they do have a meeting community September 12th, resource. but that's but got ours is October 3rd. Right. right. But um, legislative matters was supposed to be October 10th, but had to reschedule. So we had just They're moving there. Yeah. Um, yes. Yep, but so um, we're not looking at us. We're no, we. Right. I'm just yeah hoping that you know an hour ordinarily would have been enough time for city services, and I. Think yeah, judging by tonight, it might not be. Um, so, Councilor <laughs> Perry, we were meeting at five with um, kid pickup schedules. Is that is we, so? Our choices are either for us to meet earlier um, or to ask legislative matters to meet later. Um, so. Um, 
Let me see. It's a Monday. We're talking about legislative matters. Yeah. Oh, cool. And they're scheduled what every three weeks, right? It, it's just they're trying to reschedule their October meeting because they're just the second the Monday of the month. Day. So oh. I, I because could, of that holiday. All right. Yeah. I could be here. I just have to, I don't have to drive carpool on Mondays. I just have to drop off. And the drop off is at four at the bowling alley. So oh. I can get back. Oh. Here. <laughs> like, could, little, we, could we meet at 4 30 so you don't have to I could yeah do a land speed record? Yeah. 4 30? I think that should work for me. Maybe they could move back till 6 30. But right. If we go up to 4 30 and they go back to 6 30, Laura, is that a okay. reasonable day for you? Yes. As a human? Okay. That's yeah. fine. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. Two subcommittees equals one council meeting. <laughs> okay. Sort of. Okay. Yeah, it's fine. Question, please. Yeah. Councillor Foster. So we're looking at doing it instead of 5, 4 30, our meeting. And 4 30 have, on Monday, October 3rd. Okay. Yes. Right now we have people coming in on a round table also. Right. So right. how long will right. our, our meeting be scheduled? Looking at what we did tonight on surveillance cameras and so forth like that. You're looking at tonight. We did a two, what, two hours and five minute meeting here. Yeah, we're I, so if what Laura's saying, if if legislative matters can meet at 6 30. That would allot two hours for our meeting. Okay, good. All right. Yeah, to I make sure I we don't want us being rushed on that. No, I don't either. I want to make sure we have enough time, and we can always continue it if we need to. Um, or you know, but um, we'll. I, I think two hours should do it. So we're looking at four thirty. Four thirty. Okay. Oh, okay. Thanks for having for troubleshooting that, so we don't have to totally oh, thanks reschedule for flagging it, Laura. legislative matters. Appreciate it. Got to do what we can do. Yes. Okay. <laughs> now contact Alex Jarrett. I think I'd rather go bowling. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right, everyone. Have a good night. Good night. Thanks so much. Good night, everybody.